All right. So next, uh, since we have dealt with this assembly, um, we also can't leave uh, event handling alone. So uh, there are actually two instructions uh, that will be useful for the next lab, actually. Um, and these instructions are used for synchronization. Uh, one of them is called wait for event. And all it does is it puts the ARM processor into a low power mode, and it just waits around until a, either a send event, which is the next instruction that I have down here. Uh, either the send event occurs, or a physical IRQ, FIQ, or an asynchronous abort occurs. So if either of these uh, events occur, then it wakes up. Um, it keeps sleeping. So, um, and this is used primarily to synchronize uh, different co pieces of code uh, and across multiple cores. Even so, uh, and it's used for spin locks. Next, we'll talk about uh, some exclusive instructions. So the two exclusive instructions are called uh, load LDREX, which is uh, load exclusive, and STREX, which is store exclusive. Uh, prior to ARM v6, uh, mostly there were only two atomic instructions available. So if you remember exchange uh, from x86, there used to be something called swap and swap byte, uh, which was SWPB. Um, but now it's been deprecated uh, in the sense that it's still available, but uh, it's not used as much as uh, load exclusive, store exclusive. Uh, the reason is because the swap was implemented as a read locked write, uh, which means it doesn't uh, allow you to uh, read the value until it's finished writing to it. So uh, the idea was if you swap something, um, only after the swap occurred could you actually re uh, access the values, right? The problem was uh, uh, be between the read, lo uh, read lock and the write, you weren't able to do any operations uh, in your assembly code. Uh, so if you wanted to implement something like a semaphore uh, or something like that, you, you weren't able to do that. So, um, so that's why they came up with these load exclusive, store exclusive, uh, and I'll go into how they work in a bit. So, so the BDH here is uh, just for uh, byte, uh, double word, or half word. And that actually allows you to do 64 bits, I guess, two words at a time. Um, and let's go to the next one. So there is no. Uh, no access to memory allowed between the load exclusive, store exclusive instructions, uh, but uh, you can actually write code in between them to do other things, um, as we'll see in lab five. Um, so after starting a load exclusive, uh, if you want to abort the exclusive operation for any reason, you can use the clear exclusive CLREX operation. Um, and you can also use the data memory barrier, uh, which is one of the earlier uh, instructions we had looked at. And this was for, uh, this actually what it does is it only allows access uh, to registers uh, on that one processor. So the memory barrier is only applicable to the processor that it's running on. Um, and so other processors could uh, technically, I guess, um, continue accessing their registers, or they could access this uh, core's registers. You know. um, and this is actually used mostly uh, on the one core of that one processor. So it, the d data memory barrier, uh, as I mentioned earlier again, it ensures the correct order of operations or memory accesses. And it only after it's finished, uh, you can turn off the data memory barrier um, using the send event, actually. So uh, we'll see that in the atomic lab. So you got to go into your emulator. Let's see if I can share it. So 
to go into uh, projects in an atomic. So here you'll see two files, uh, atomic.c and then mutex.s. So the uh, goal of this lab is to uh, implement the mutex using the uh, load exclusive, store exclusive instructions. And uh, the atomic.c actually just has a uh, lib pthread code. So it essentially creates two threads uh, that, that are actually the same function called do something. So if you look at atomic.c, it's using the uh, pthread library that you see included up top here. So, and all it's doing is it's uh, creating in the main function, creates two threads uh, that call the same method. But it also calls uh, two methods, uh, which is up here. So there's lock mutex and then unlock mutex. So this is to sort of uh, ensure, uh, this is sort of like a semaphore, I guess, if you will. So where only one uh, thread can get into this section of code, execute it, and then uh, return. So this is the method, do something. And here are the two threads that are started. So all you'll need to do is actually modify the mutex locking and unlocking mechanism here. So you have to use load exclusive, store exclusive instructions in between this and here. So I've actually included the solution. But And this is actually an example that ARM provides. So, um, and this is not the best way of implementing a mutex. Just putting that up. But it is a way. pseudocode for how you go about locking the mutex using uh, load explosive and store explosive. And mutex unlock is actually the easiest. Actually, if, you, if you'll see in your uh, assembly mutex code, there's actually a variable for unlock value. So for a, it's called equals unlocked. So you can use that. So once you've written the code, you can actually type make and uh, run the executable. Test it out. So as compared to my notes, I believe the architecture reference manual is given. Um, and that's probably going to be more helpful uh, for looking at how these instructions work. Yeah, um, just another quick announcement. If you guys want to save all your work uh, at, at the end of the class, I would recommend that you use the uh, SSH folder that we set up uh, inside the VM. Um, so if you go to like places and arm, and all you have to do actually is copy the root and projects. So this has all your labs except for the interrupts lab. And for the interrupts lab, actually, if you go to your home folder on the VM, there is a projects directory. Uh, and then copy, I believe you'll need interrupts. 
uh, and just grab the code. Um, and what I can do is I can post this VM on TempSpace. And then you can actually copy those folders back into the VM. So it'll uh, keep your work, essentially. And if you still haven't figured it out by now, the solutions are in the dot solutions directory, in the projects folder uh, on the VM. So there are actually two things um, I'd like to highlight. So in the manual, if you actually look at uh, exclusive access, you'll see that uh, the store exclusive instruction actually uh, returns a value into, a, into the destination register. Um, if the store exclusive is successful, it actually puts a value of 0. Uh, and if it's not successful, its value is 1. And uh, so essentially what they've done is uh, they've taken the swap instruction, which takes the read lock uh, right, and kind of separated it into this load exclusive, which is sort of the read lock piece, and then the store exclusive, which is also sort of a write lock. Um, and so if you actually go to the page 6, uh, the store exclusive instruction uh, takes the uh, actual memory location you want to write to in a register uh, and uh, what value you want to write. And then finally, if the store is actually successful, it writes the 0 or 1 into this destination register. So that's sort of the usage for store exclusive. Load exclusive only takes uh, two registers, which is the um, uh, base address of uh, the memory location you want to write to and uh, the actual value that you, uh, that you, or the register that you want to load into. So, so that's why if you So sort of the pseudocode, um, and this is sort of based on what uh, Arn came up with. So if you have a better solution, please do let me know. Um, so, so essentially the mutex lock function, so a mutex tries to uh, allow access in a safe manner to a critical section of code, right, uh, that's shared between two processes. Um, so that's what a mutex does. And if you look at um, the code under uh, atomic or yeah, atomic.c, so here. So if you look uh, in Atomic.c, you'll notice that there's a, there's an argument being passed to lock mutex, and it's called mutex locks, and it's defined as an unsigned integer up here, and it's initially set to the value unlocked, which is defined to be zero, uh, and locked, which is uh, defined to be one. So this is just for convention, but those values could be uh, anything. So, um, so the idea is that do something is a critical section of code, uh, and you want to order the uh, the processes that get access to this function essentially. Um, and once that process is done, it unlocks the mutex and allows the other one to enter essentially. Um, so, uh, in order to do this, I actually slightly modified the solution, but um, it still works. So the idea is uh, your pseudocode is to loop and try to get an exclusive read lock uh, on the argument that's passed into mutex lock. So if you're able to read it, um, then you know that you can write to it. Um, so it's that's why you end up first loading the lock value here. 
You can choose to do, the, do it this way, or you can actually choose to uh, use constants there instead of using equals locked and equals unlocked. You can just uh, use constants in its place. I just thought this would be more descriptive. Um, so this equals locked is actually a memory location. So you can't just um, you can't just use equals as a immediate constant uh, in your assembly code. So you have to load that value into a register first. So in this case, for the lock mutex code, uh, I just ended up loading the locked value and the unlocked value into R1 and R3. And then uh, you try to load the value from the argument that's being passed in through R0. Uh, if you remember, the mutex lock call in atomic.c uh, passes the, address, the pointer to the unsigned integer mutex lock. So that's an address. And you try to do an exclusive read on it. And then what you do is you compare R2, uh, which is the value that you just read, to the actual um, unlocked value, right? So here, you want to make sure that before you lock the mutex, that the actual value is unlocked so that you can gain the lock on it, essentially. So, so once you're able to do that, um, then what you do is, this is a, uh, if you remember the, the conditional mnemonics, um, where this is actually a store exclusive if equals. Uh, so what you're doing here is you're making sure that it's unlocked. And only if it's unlocked, you try to write uh, the locked value into the um, destination, which is your mutex lock variable, which is being passed into this function. So if you're able to read it exclusively and make sure that it's uh, unlocked, then only you try to write the locked value and actually lock the mutex. Um, and then, uh, as, as I pointed out earlier, the store exclusive actually returns a value into R2, which is this destination register that tells you whether the, it was able to write successfully or not. And so what you can do is you can compare that and see if you were able to get the lock on the mutex. And if it's unsuccessful, which is, uh, this is a branch if not equals. So if, if it was successful, it would have uh, written a 0. If it's unsuccessful, it writes a 1. So you, you know at this point whether it's written successfully or not. So you can compare uh, if it was successful. If it's not successful, uh, it branches back to this label.l1 uh, and then tries to get the lock all over again. So this is sort of uh, the following the um, logic that I have here for the pseudocode. And so once you're able to lock, uh, unlocking should be trivial. You don't need to uh, exclusively check uh, if the mutex has been locked to, in order to unlock it, but uh, you can. <laughs> so I just chose to actually just write uh, the value of unlock. So same as I do in lock mutex, I load the unlocked value, and then I actually uh, store that value directly into the uh, argument that's being passed in here. It's again going to be the same argument, which is mutex lock, which is an unsigned integer, uh, the pointer to an unsigned integer. So I just write the unlocked value in there and then um, leave. So does this sort of make sense? Uh, this is just a poor man's mutex implementation, but uh, I'm sure there are better implementations out there. So if you have any, please let me know. I'd be interested. Uh, the other interesting thing to note here is that uh, the LDREX and STREX are a pair, which means LDREX actually, uh, when both of these instructions are used, it uh, marks the physical memory. Uh, saying that there's an exclusive access going on. Uh, and with virtual memory implementations on some of the SOC uh, boards, it will actually uh, mark the physical address. And the uh, VMSA implementation has to take that into account, essentially. Um, but those two are a pair, which means if you use LDREX, you can't use STREXB. 
Uh, you have to use LDR-EXB with STR-EXB uh, and LDR-EX with STR-EX. Does that make sense? Um, and as you can see, in between the LDR-EX and STR-EX, there's no memory access going on. Uh, I, uh, I tried to load the value of unlocked before the LDREX occurred, uh, and then I use it sort of in between. So now that we've covered uh, sort of atomic operations, so uh, this is the solution. Uh, it's slightly different here. I actually use the constant directly instead of loading the unlocked value and checking uh, if it's actually unlocked or not. So I just kind of hard code the value there. Um, so. But I just thought it would be descriptive. And uh, Ben actually had this uh, question about how we can use uh, assembly on the iPhone uh, or the uh, or Android. So for iPhone, from what I've read, apparently you can uh, the Xcode actually comes with uh, uh, GNU Assembler, I believe. So you can actually compile assembly code uh, and then use the .o files and include them in your project and reference the code that way. Or you could also use uh, inline assembly. Uh, that being said, I haven't tried this out myself. So uh, you can actually go ahead and try it out. And the iPhone ABI, there's also an application binary interface uh, for ARM that's been specified by Apple. Um, so there's a handy dandy link for that. So. Uh, for Android, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, so Android comes with something called a native development kit, uh, which allows you to run native binaries uh, in conjunction with Android applications. So uh, what you have to do is first uh, get their toolkit. It actually comes with a bunch of cross-compilers tools, as well as uh, uh, native development tools for hooking things up to Android applications. So first, what you do is uh, you actually write a stub code in C, uh, just regular C that calls the assembly method, uh, like we did with our atomic lab, right? Um, and But the method has to take a specific uh, number of arguments, and you have to use JNI types. So there's something called jint for an integer that's 32. Uh, that's long, so you have to be wary of the ARM data sizes and compare them with the JNI type data sizes uh, and just use the appropriate uh, data type. Uh, so once you have done that, you can uh, you actually can copy a template make file that's available for Android NDK uh, and then compile this C stub code uh, with the assembly um, and it generates uh, some static objects. And, uh, then what you can do is uh, you use the NDK tool to actually uh, build and using that, make, uh, all that does is it uses the make file to uh, build the actual objects. And then finally, in the Android application, uh, you declare a Java function uh, with the label native. And it's going to be the same uh, method name as your um, one as the one that you use in your stub C code. And uh, the package name, interestingly, when you de uh, declare this uh, C stub code, you actually have to give a unique uh, function uh, function name that includes the package name. So uh, I can actually show you an example here. So this uh, link actually has much better. Uh, information on this, but you actually embed your package name into your JNI C uh, stub. So here, as you can see, uh, actually you can't see yet. So here, uh, you would give the package name uh, followed by the actual function name. So you say Java, Cobb, uh, Eggwall, Android, and that's sort of the package that shows up in, in your Android application. And so you just say uh, package followed by com.eggwall.android.assembly, you know, in this case. Um, and so once you have that, uh, you can actually declare this function using the native keyword and then um, 
you can actually you have to, have to also load the library using system.loadlibrary, uh, and it loads the native library, and then you can make calls to that method essentially in your Android application. Uh, does that sort of make sense? So the uh, Ben is asking what the Apple URL is. Uh, I've actually posted this uh, with the slides on my, in my transfer folder. So uh, it's actually developer.apple.com library iOS documentation Xcode conceptual. Yeah. So. So with that, uh, I've also included some useful links. Um, and this sort of concludes the class. Uh, so in retrospect, we kind of looked at, we started off with sort of what happens at Power On with these ARM boards. Uh, you enter the reset mode, right? You're in supervisor mode, and then you start executing, generally it's the bootloader, uh, at a specific address. And once the bootloader loads, then it runs the kernel and loads the RAM disk, starts running that, and then you can run whatever uh, OS on top of the kernel, whether it's Android, Linux. Um, and then we sort of went through what the assembly operations are. And uh, we went over how to use GDB, essentially, on ARM. And finally, we looked at uh, how buffer overflows might work and sort of the calling convention that ARM uses for um, parameter passing. And we also looked at uh, atomic instructions and uh, how interrupts work. So are there any questions? And we also looked at how to use inline assembly and uh, how to reference assembly code in C. So, so you guys should be ARM programming machines now. Also, please feel free to send me uh, any suggestions, corrections, uh, or ideas that you may have. Um,